the order of service that we follow this morning, we will sing the service of the church called Matins. It is one of the daily services that the church has celebrated for centuries. It is printed for you in the service folder that you received when you came in. Also, please, some, at some point today, take a moment and fill out the little black booklet in the pew. Pass it along to those who are worshiping with you this morning. Our opening hymn this morning is number 582 in the hymnal, Awake My Soul and With the Sun. Please stand. Before the one who has made us all, 
God, you taught us by your holy apostle that we are buried with Christ by baptism into death, that just as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life. 
Grant that we may walk in the grace of baptism, so that the old Adam in us may be drowned and destroyed by daily sorrow and repentance, together with all sins and evil lusts, and that again a new person may daily come forth and rise. We shall live in the presence of God in righteousness and purity forever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The first lesson this morning is written for us in the prophet Amos chapter 7. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent a message to Jeroboam king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his wor words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. And Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. You say, Do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the house of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the city and your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided up and you yourself will die in a pagan country, and Israel will certainly go into exile, away from their native land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The next lesson we'll focus on for the sermon from Mark chapter 6. Calling the twelve to him, Jesus sent them out, two by two, and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. The hymn of the day is hymn number 525 in the hymnal, The Son of God Our Christ. Holy name 
May the words that I speak, blessed Lord, and all the thoughts of our hearts and our minds be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> Albert Einstein is said to have defined insanity as doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting a different result. Certainly not a clinical definition of insanity, but practical, as we know it played out so well in our own lives. And now you're beginning to think maybe pastor's insane, because that's the exact same way he started the sermon last week. Have you ever told someone, children or somebody working for you, I've told you time and time and time again. I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times. Our Lord has given his church one mission, one job to do. Go. Proclaim. Share the message of salvation. God made flesh in Jesus Christ. Christ has lived, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again on the last day to judge the living and the dead. Every member of Christ's church has a part in carrying out this work. For some, called to publicly teach and preach and administer the sacraments, that'd be the pastor. Others called to teach. Children especially. Some lead. Some quietly work. Most support the work and the mission of the church in some way. But then the work also is carried out in our homes. With our families. Those we work with, those we live near. We do the work together as a larger church, like we just saw, on the other side of the world, in villages where they have houses and trees. Which of the kids were watching that and saying, how cool would it be to live in Thailand, huh? We know that we all have a part in the church's work. Not a single one of us can say, it's somebody else's job. Or somebody else will do it so that I don't have to do it. So we get to hear pretty much the same thing we talked about last week. And it's not insanity to focus again on the work that Christ has given to His church. It is the reality for His church and for you who are members of the church. We need to hear it again because we need to be pushed to do the work. Our sinful priorities must be exposed. Our excuses need to be shown for what they are and our reluctance changed into confidence. It's time to go. Go out. 
if we do Jesus' work. It's important to remember what happened in the Gospel lesson last week. Jesus was in his own hometown of Nazareth, and he had just been rejected by those who knew him best, by those who you think would accept him, his family, his friends, those he grew up with. And it's almost as if they are walking the road out of Nazareth, Jesus leading his disciples, and not far out of town, Jesus just stops, and he turns around to his disciples and says, now it's your turn. Turn for what? To do what Jesus had been doing? Absolutely. To have happened to them what just happened to him? Certainly. Now, well, last week we focused more on the challenges that we face as we carry out Jesus' work. Today we have the opportunity to focus on the positive side of doing that. Because we easily can sit and lament at how difficult the work is going to be because of how our society has fallen so far, or we can look at the situation in which the church now works and see the grand opportunity. Then we see the disciples as Jesus sends them out. And they go, and they went out and preached that people should repent. We understand that our work that Christ has given the church is so necessary it is absolutely urgent. And we must share in this urgency that Christ has and his disciples go and do their work. Because nothing's changed from then till now. Everybody's still a sinner. Before birth, already steeped in that sinful nature, doomed for the fires of hell. Everyone. The reality of that sin is seen so clearly, not only in our own lives, but turn on the news. I haven't been doing that much lately, but what do you see? Violence, pedophile, bullying, mass murders, domestic terror, it's all around. Not long ago I saw a bumper sticker that said, Hate is a learned behavior, but that's also a part of the urgency that we have. That's somebody trying to cop out of the responsibility of their own sin and blame somebody else. Our work is urgent because we know what's at stake. The message of repentance that we must deal with sin for exactly what it is. There is urgency in our work because we have a message that all need to, be, need to hear if they are to be saved from hell. And so we realize then what our work really is. It is not the church's mission to make America a more moral society. It is the work of the church to reveal sin for what it is and bring the forgiveness of sins to people. Our work is urgent. We understand how serious it is that it's just not a matter of life or death, but it is a matter of heaven or hell. There are no gray areas. There is no in-between. This is the work that we have. Maybe we don't see that urgency so much. Because as we look at the people alongside of us, we see people just like us, right? Mark gives us the kind of punch-by-punch -punch version of Jesus' ministry. In Matthew's account of this same sending out of the twelve disciples, we have the opportunity to look through Jesus' eyes. 
The disciples were just like us. They looked and, oh, hey, there's Joe. And Joe was Joe. But as Jesus looked at the crowds of people, he saw their hearts. He saw that they were spiritually lost. That they were spiritually helpless. That they were spiritually terrorized. Jesus could see this and he tells his disciples and he tells this to us so that we share the urgency. We don't just look at the people around us and see people, but we see souls who need to be saved. But now what if Jesus would come and stand in our midst or in our homes and say to us, I've given you one thing to do and I've repeated this over and over and over again. And then what would he see? Would he see such urgency? Or would he see us behave like children who sit on the couch and think, well, I'll get to it when I feel like getting to it. Will he see a congregation making every effort to make connections in its community? Will he see the work of the church being fully supported? Will, see, will he see an utter reliance on the word and on the sacraments? Or will he see a church that has turned to a bunch of other stuff to carry out its work better? Would he see confidence in the great things that God's people can do? Would he see self-righteousness that hears, I've done my part, it's time for somebody else to do theirs, or laziness that says, I punched in Sunday morning, somebody else can do the rest. It's urgent work, isn't it? We know how urgent it is. And we know where the work of Christ must begin. It must begin right at home in our hearts. They went and preached that people should repent. And so must we. For laziness, lack of commitment for every excuse that shows a lack of urgency. And we know that repentance is not simply that we hang our head in shame and feel sorry for what we've done or not. Repentance is essentially not simply sorry but a shame. A change in the heart that changes attitudes and actions. And a change which, of course, only Jesus can bring. We must repent. And know our own sin. And have Jesus change our hearts. And take all of our sins away. Each and every day as Christ has given us this work to do. We must live this repentance. Just as we prayed in Luther's great morning prayer a few moments ago. Every day drown the sinful nature which makes the excuses and is the core of the laziness. Drown that in Christ's death and baptism. The daily... I rise forth anew to serve God, to do what Jesus has for us to do. When the work of Christ begins right here at home in the heart, we will know its urgency. And realize that now the, church, the work of the church is not to go out and change the world. It's not to go out and even change the city of Waukesha. 
It wasn't Jesus' mission, it's not ours either. The work that Jesus has given his church is going to happen one person at a time. One soul at a time. Just as has happened to each and every one of you. And now hasn't the work that Jesus give, has given us become so much simpler when you think of it in these terms? One person, one soul at a time. The church harms itself when it loses focus on this. And it, and it focuses on big things like the final number of members, the total number of members. Or when it focuses on the bottom line, the budget, and starts counting cents. One person, one soul at a time. Of course, I realize that it costs money to keep the lights on and the air conditioning going. But I'm sure you understand what I'm talking about here. But as we come together as Christ's family. We realize the great miracles that stand before us as the reminders of who we are. Instead of worrying about how many total members we have, there in front of you is where you were made a child of God. All your sins were washed away. There is where members are joined to the body of Christ. Who cares how many? We're worried about dollars and cents. We fail to see the great things that God has placed upon our hands and upon our lips. In His body and blood. He takes all of our sins away. All the worries and the frustrations as we carry out His work are all taken away. When we realize the great thing that Jesus has done for us. Look at what he said to his disciples. Realize what you have. And don't take any money. Don't take extra clothes. Wear some shoes. Don't take the air mattress either. Don't look in your triptych to see where the next McDonald's is. Just go. I promise to give you everything you need. It's time for us to get out and go and do the work and rely on this promise of Jesus. That He will give us everything, and I mean absolutely everything we need to carry out His work. So I can say, well, I don't know anybody that needs to hear about Jesus, and guess what? God will make sure that you know someone who needs to hear about Jesus. Or, I might say, I don't know what to say. And God answers that by saying, I will give you what to say. I might say, well, I can't do what that person is doing. And either the Lord will give you the ability to do it, or He will give you something you can do that that person can't. He will give you everything you need to do what He has commanded us to do. When the church becomes frustrated in carrying out its work, right here is the problem. A simple lack of trust in Jesus' promise that He will provide everything needed it's time for us to go and to get out and do Jesus' work. As He keeps this promise, we know that His people can do great things. His people can make connections in the community that weren't there before. Build bridges rather than burn them. His people are little children when faith put quarters in the collection plate and people who place 
much, much more. His church is able to encourage young people who say, maybe I can be a pastor or teacher. His church has those who lead and have those who quietly work. Jesus' church has absolutely everything it needs to carry out its work. Because it has you and the promise of Christ Himself to give you everything you need. The work is very urgent. We know that. And together we rely on the promise of Christ. Let's get out and go and do Jesus' work. Amen. Please stand. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. With one heart and voice we confess our faith this morning by singing the Te Deum Laudamus. We praise you, our God, we praise you on page 8. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. With the angels in heaven, we praise you, we praise you. With the cherubim and seraphim, we praise you. We praise you with apostles and prophets. We praise you, we praise you with the martyrs and your holy church. We sing in endless praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. Father holy, all creation offers praise. Creator of all things, we praise you, we praise you. O Jesus Christ, the Son of God, we praise you, we praise you. O Spirit most holy, we praise you. We praise you to the Trinity most blessed. We sing in endless praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. O Christ, of glory we praise you we praise you you became a man to set us free we praise you we praise you you have risen to free us we praise you we praise you and with all your saints in glory we sing in heaven this praise. You are God, we praise you. You are Lord, we acclaim you. To you, O Father holy, all creation offers praise. All creation offers praise. All creation offers Please be seated.
Please stand. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and to bring forth fruits in faith and hope and love to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, you are a very present help in time of trouble. Let not the heart of your people fail when fear comes, but sustain and comfort them. We come before your mercy for the families of the four Marines and one sailor who have perished in the act of terrorism this past week. Heal the hurting and wounded. Console those who mourn the loss of their loved ones. Protect the innocent and the helpless. And deliver those who are still in harm's way from all evil. Gracious God and Father, your Son, Jesus Christ, came to bring us heavenly peace. Yet violence, conflict, and rage still raise their ugly heads among us. Bring restoration of calm and security to the survivors and all those in the neighborhood. Heal the wounds that have been inflicted. Preserve peace. Open your fatherly heart and bountiful hand to help all in need. Grant that we all may live together in unity and peace. And that all hatred and ill will be remembered no more. Give us the peace that the world cannot give us. And grant us grace that delivered from all conflict and strife, we may live in harmony and safety. And finally, having gained the eternal rest of the saints in glory, may praise and bless and worship and glorify you forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless and keep you. Amen. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. Amen. The Lord grant you peace for all your days. Amen. Please be seated. We sing hymn number 293, God's Word is Our Great Heritage. Yeah. 